Shalom and welcome to a new podcast from Me Israel for Fred. MIF is the largest non-religious, non-partisan pro-Israel group in Europe, defending Israel in Norway, Denmark, Sweden and Iceland. Usually, as you most of you know, we communicate in those four Nordic languages, but occasionally we have English-speaking guests in our podcasts and we also have a video archive on YouTube and Facebook with numerous interesting lectures in English from our conferences in the uh, previous years. So have a look and make sure you subscribe and get the notifications of future live streams and videos. And the like button is not far away from you, so just click it now. Yeah, did you do it? Great, thanks, I like you too. Our guest today is Jeffrey Herf, Professor of Modern European History at the University of Maryland. He is the author of the new book, Israel's Moment, International Support for an Opposition, International Support for an Opposition to Establishing the Jewish State, 1945-1949. So, um, welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you, Matt Israel, for inviting me. Yeah, it's, it's uh, wonderful to have you. And... I read uh, your book um, this summer and it was really fascinating, outstanding research and um, yeah, Thank you. Uh, so, so many surprises, um, even though I have uh, worked with these issues for, for all my adult life. Uh, and so my first question would be, what was your biggest surprise? Uh, while doing this uh, research? Well, that the book ha wasn't written by somebody else many years ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but seriously, uh, the biggest surprise... Uh, well, the I, of course, was aware that there were aspects of the United States State Department that were not enthusiastic about the establishment of the State of Israel. Mm -hmm. But my work in the National Archives and the State Department and Pentagon files uh, indicated that an anti-Zionist consensus had emerged in the State Department well beyond the, the Arabists who had uh, ambassadors in the, in the Arab world. And uh, that this opposition was intense and consequential. I, I think that the book reveals really certainly outside the Hebrew language literature for the first time, the intensity of opposition by the British and American uh, national security uh, establishment to the establishment of the Jewish state. Uh, I think um, I was not surprised because I've done previous work, but I think that it's the, the extent of support from uh, leftist and liberal groups in the United States and in France, and then the Soviet bloc is something that didn't come to as a surprise to me as a historian, but I mm. think it'll come as a surprise uh, to many readers uh, yeah. who are not aware of those constellations, uh, those political constellations of 1947-48. Uh, yeah, and because the, the, so, the, so many... So many people, I guess, uh, especially here in Scandinavia, in Norway at least, uh, they think that uh, the U.S. strongly supported Israel from the beginning and was sending uh, weaponry, weapon, weaponry and and uh, all kind of economical help. Um, no, so... no, not at all. Uh, I mean, well, President Harry Truman uh, supported the partition resolution in 1947 and recognized the Jewish state. Mm -hmm. And his decisions were very consequential and important. But the uh, the United States sent no weapons uh, and, and on the contrary, imposed an arms embargo on the region when when the Jews needed uh, and needed weapons very badly. Uh, the um, uh, the the view that the United States supported Israel uh, in the early years is a projection of realities of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s back into the 1940s. And uh, people often make that that mistake. But in this sense, the past really was a foreign country, as historians are wont to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 
the notion that, quote, Western imperialism, to use the term of art, uh, had something to do with the establishment of the state of Israel is completely mistaken. Uh, mm. On the contrary, uh, the, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, the Secretary of Defense, uh, leading officials in the British Foreign Office all opposed the establishment of the Jewish state for two primary, primarily two reasons. First, they thought that it, because it would antagonize the Arabs, it would be bad for Western access to oil. Mm -hmm. And second, uh, they associated the Jews and the Zionists with communism. Mm -hmm. And uh, they thought that the establishment of the Jewish state would uh, enhance Soviet prospects in the Middle East and undermine uh, the new Cold War containment of, of the Soviet Union and communism. Did, did they have a uh, good reason to to conflate the, Jews with, with communism? Well, uh, there was a, there was in the air of the 20th century the association of Jews with communism, which was a, a part of uh, fascist and uh, Nazi anti-Semitic associations of Jews with communism. Um, but uh, in 19... From 45 to 49, the Soviet Union uh, uh, assisted the Jewish immigration to Palestine uh, from, from Eastern Europe, uh, from the Soviet bloc, uh, in the hopes that uh, the Jewish immigrants to Palestine uh, would be sympathetic to the Soviet Union. And indeed, there were uh, left-leaning uh, uh, Jews and Zionists who were very sympathetic to the Soviet Union. Uh, so... Uh, mm -hmm. The British, in, British and American intelligence observed that they observed that the KGB was allowing uh, Jews to emigrate more easily than others, uh, and uh, uh, but then leaped to the conclusion that this was uh, a view of the Zionist leadership, which it was mm -hmm. not. And David Ben Gurion yeah. and Moshe Sheret were quite clear that while they appreciated the assistance they got from the Soviet bloc. Uh, they were by no means uh, communists. And, uh, uh, but the British and American intelligence agencies on the whole didn't make those fine distinctions. Uh, yeah. And uh, so the opposition to the Zionist project was in a way, in a way part of the new mentalities of the Cold War and uh, Western anti-communism. Yeah, uh, that brings me to a quote that I want to bring up uh, in your book, Zionism's Most Empathic Empathic support came from those infused with the liberal and leftist anti-Nazi passions of World War II and from Jewish survivors of the Holocaust and their fellow Jews. So, uh, documenting this, sorry that this quote uh, came uh, top of your face, um, yeah. but it came from your head <laughs> yes. originally. No, I wrote that. That, 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 <laughs> yeah. that is the case. Uh, it, yeah, yeah, go ahead. It's a book about New York, and I'll bet that if uh, uh, and Paris and uh, but I'll bet that that if you look at the newspapers in Oslo and Stockholm mm -hmm. in 1945, 46, 47, 48, I wouldn't be surprised if you find similar sentiments. So it would be interesting for you yeah. and for people in Scandinavia uh, to uh, look at who was who was uh, uh, what was the mood about uh, about uh, the Zionist project in the Scandinavian countries in the immediate years after World War II and the Holocaust. And I would yep. not be surprised at all uh, if you find similar uh, kind of arguments. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, there, is a, there is a Norwegian professor of history that has done quite extensive research on that. Oh, really? she's, she's quite anti-Zionistic and critical to our organization, but I appreciate her book about those years uh, 40, 46, 47, 48, where she, she, she shows exactly the same that like you were doing in the book, how, how there was a, like a brief moment where, where the Norwegian government supported a Jewish state and then it's, it very quickly eroded. So, um, maybe you could like, you call your book, the, the Israel's moment. Um, so maybe explain in the most simple terms why why there was such a narrow window of, of opportunity for for ben gurion and and his and the other lead, zionistic leaders to to um to establish the states 
David Ben-Gurion is one of the greatest political leaders of world history in the 20th century. I come away with that, that with that uh, conclusion after, after uh, working on the book. Uh, and he understood that uh, the decisions of the Soviet Union and Stalin uh, to, support the Zion, to support the Zionist project would not last long. And uh, that the immediate aftermath of World War II and the Holocaust um, had created momentum uh, in favor of establishing a Jewish state in Palestine, both for two for several reasons. First, because uh, those who the Zionist project was seen as a continuation of wartime anti-fascism, and the opposition to the Zionist project by Hajjaman al-Husseini and the, and the Arab Higher Committee was seen in liberal and leftist circles as a continuation of Nazi collaboration. That is, they had collaborated with the Nazis during World War II, and their opposition to the Jewish state was understood at the time in New York and uh, uh, Paris and London uh, as a continuation of, of, of uh, uh, the anti-Semitism that they had articulated when they collaborated with the Nazis. Mm-hmm. And uh, the but in spring of 1947, uh, President Truman articulated the Truman Doctrine and uh, the Cold War was beginning. And the the um, uh, Israel was created in that moment uh, in the very first months of the Cold War, mm-hmm. uh, when the memories of the Second World War were still a factor in world politics, hence Israel's moment. Mm-hmm. And uh in the fall of 1949, Stalin concluded that uh, the new state of Israel was not going to be pro-Soviet, and the Soviet Union uh, changed its policy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was a very brief window uh, of two years. Uh, and uh, uh, after, had Israel not been established, then uh, it would have been very difficult uh, mm-hmm. for that to happen in the face of um, opposition, both from the Soviet Union and and uh, uh, lack of enthusiasm, to put it mildly, uh, yeah. from the British and American uh, national security establishments. Uh, so, uh, from from uh, looking uh, uh, on these uh, developments from from Norway, uh, France has not been much covered. Uh, right. But um, you bring out really fascinating details uh, that uh, both. Uh, shame the French people and, and or the leaders, but also uh, put them in a positive light. I mean, how they let uh, the the Grand Mufti uh, escape, and also how they allowed Jewish refugees going through French ports. So maybe you should can can explain for our viewers about. Yes, that. you put it well. I I um, I'm a historian of modern German history. Uh, uh, but this time I did some research in the French National Archives in Pierrefitte and the French Diplomatic Archives in La Carneuve. Both of them are near Paris. Uh, the French government was a coalition government and uh, the foreign ministry uh, shared those basically the same views uh, regarding the Zionist project in the Arab world as did the State Department and the British Foreign Office. Uh, the French government had arrested Hajimina Hosseini in May of 45 and kept him in custody for a year. And the book examines the debates and discussions in the French government, between the French government and the British government, about whether or not to indict uh, the Mufti. And the French Foreign Office concluded that it would be best to be on the good side of the Mufti and to... Uh, uh, facilitate uh, to treat him well, not to indict him, uh, and make his escape basically not so difficult. So that the France would then, uh, so the thinking of the Foreign Office went, uh, receive goodwill from the Arabs. Um, uh, and then he, quote, escaped in uh, uh, June of 1946, uh, and uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, leader Hassan al-Banna thanked the French government profusely, uh, as did Hussein. Uh, 
that was a terrible lost opportunity. Uh, a trial mm-hmm. of Husseini in 1945 or 46 would have brought a great deal into the public domain and perhaps made it easier for more moderate, for moderate uh, compromise, uh, uh, moderate leaders in uh, Palestine to come to the fore. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, socialist uh, ministers were in control of the interior ministry, the ministry in France that controlled borders and ports and visas and passports and the like. And they facilitated uh, and worked with the Mossad in facilitating uh, Jewish immigration coming from Poland and Hungary and Czechoslovakia through displaced persons camps in Austria and Germany, and then uh, into southern France, basically mostly to Marseille, but not only, and then from Marseille on boats to Palestine. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the the interior ministry infuriated the British Foreign Office by facilitating uh, uh, Jewish immigration to Palestine at a time when the British were trying to prevent it. So uh, uh, Jules Mock and Edward de Preux were the ministers in the, uh, of the interior, and uh, they were they knew exactly what they were doing. Mm. Uh, so that uh, uh, that story uh, is, in a way, the beginning of the most consequential Western alliance with Israel in the first two decades of its existence, and the most consequential alliance was not with the United States but with France. Uh, and it was France that, um, uh, that assisted Israel after the Soviet turn against Israel, that assisted Israel with uh, military deliveries, both to its air force and also in the nuclear project. So uh, the role of France is, is, is one that needs more attention. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and the book, uh, the book does that. Yep. Yep. Um, so it's it's a period that is not covered by your book, but I'm I'm curious uh, if you know when, when and how did the shift happen in in the U.S. State Department and the CIA and other um, important American offices from from being anti-Zionistic to become more sympathetic to to Israel. Well, probably by the 1950s, you know, anti-Zionism is probably a bit too strong uh, mm. to describe American policies. A tepid support, um, uh, uh, the um, uh, I, I wouldn't say uh, I, I, anti-Zionism is, is is too strong a term to describe American policies in the 1950s and 60s. But uh, the but the United States kept its distance. And the change took place after the Six Day War of 1967, because uh, from the perspective of American foreign relations, what Israel had demonstrated in 1967 was that it could de- defeat uh, a whole range of uh, Soviet bloc uh, weapons uh, in the air and on the ground. And uh, it was then uh, under Linda Johnson, President Johnson, and then and then. Uh, you know, well, primarily under Johnson, that the policy of the United States changed to a more active engagement and support. Uh, so it, they, what people think of as American support for Israel in a consequential manner didn't really uh, uh, take place uh, oh, until 1969, 68, 69, 70, around then. Hmm. And people project those, people project that relationship back into the into the years of its establishment yeah yeah so what you what you document in the book is that um, the more uh, socialist socialist or or liberal uh politicians were around 1947 1948 the more um, uh the more um they basically supported uh establishment of a jewish state and why do you think that the the left uh both in europe especially in europe but also increasingly in the us has has turned against uh, israel historical ignorance plays a great deal uh, uh plays an important role um mm-hmm. in 1940 in the late 40s the meaning of terms like anti-imperialism, 
anti-racism, anti-colonialism, were all associated with support for the Zionist project. The establishment of the State of Israel was fighting against British colonialism. Uh, uh, racism uh, in those years referred to the views of the leaders of the Arab Higher Committee, uh, who argued that the Arab world was a racial homogeneity and the Jews in Palestine would disrupt this homogeneity. Uh, so anti-racism was a criticism of the Palestinian leadership. Right? Uh, and uh, so the, all these famous words of liberal and leftist sentiment, of anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, anti-racism, were pro-Zionist. Even uh, my colleague Paul Landau has, has written a fine book about Nelson Mandela, uh, and Mandela was one of those many people around the world who associated the Zionist project early on with anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism because of the struggle against uh, the British presence mm -hmm. in Palestine. Um, the contemporary left uh, it has um, been influenced by uh, the very successful propaganda campaigns of the Soviet bloc and then the Palestinian Authority, which reversed the meaning of these famous words. Yeah. Uh, and so now racism was associated with Zionism and Zionism was presented as a colonial enterprise. Uh, uh, which just reverses the realities um, of, of the crucial years, just turns them right on their head. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, that is a very widespread misconception. That yeah. uh, So the meaning of, of, of famous words, liberal and left, they change, and, and they change, uh, they change their meaning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. People who, who, who would who were leftists and liberals in 1947-48 regarding the Zionist issue uh, would be regarded as, as arch conservatives today uh, or in some quarters at any rate. Hmm. Uh, so the, the book re underscores the importance of historical research and, and grasping the difference of the past to the present as opposed yeah. to projecting what exists in the present into the past. Is this uh, your first book about Israel related issues? No, uh, the uh, in two thousand. Well, I uh, my work on German history led led to uh, an interest in this. In nineteen ninety seven, I published Divided Memory, the Nazi Past and the Two Germanies, and that was about a that included discussion of a famous purge trial of Paul Merker, who was a communist. Mm -hmm. and uh, who supported the Zionist project and then spent several years in prison as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, Nazi propaganda for the Arab world was published in 2009, and that uh, is a book about Nazi Germany's radio and print Arabic language propaganda offensives in North Africa and the Middle East during mm -hmm. World War II and the aftermath. And then undeclared wars with Israel in 2016 uh, which was translated into German, uh, is about East Germany and the West German radical left and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, their antagonism to the state of Israel. So um, uh, this book really follows, uh, this book is not, there was no German government uh, between mm -hmm. 1945 and 49, and Germany was not a factor uh, yeah. uh, in the, these crucial years. This is the first book that is really not directly about German history, uh, mm -hmm. It's about its aftermath, um, but the previous works lead uh, led directly to this book. Yeah, interesting. So um, I have more reading to do. What well, what, what will yeah, be your next I, book? I, I'm going to write a uh, synthetic little, the smaller book and uh, uh, called Three Faces of Antisemitism, which will be about uh, uh, traditional right wing. Nazi and neo-Nazi anti-Semitism, uh, uh, anti-Semitism when it, when it assumes leftist dimensions and uh, Islamist-inspired anti-Semitism. So mm. that'll be a more synthetic, shorter book. This yeah. Israel's moment is a long book; it's uh, yeah. five hundred pages. So my yeah. congratulations to you that you read the you read the book. It, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, the, the history 
writing writing serious history requires a great deal of research and and compiling mm -hmm. an enormous amount of evidence and yep. uh it's not the same as a tweet uh, or uh, a short <laughs> online essay but yep. uh I, but i hope that the book really i hope the people who disagree with me read the book mm -hmm. rather than ignore it um yep. it's 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 um uh because the evidence is quite striking and and uh and I, I know what you said at the outset of our conversation that though you know a great deal about this subject, there were things in the book that you that you learned from. Mm. And, uh, yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. Yeah. Um, well, do you think so in um, in 1948 or 1947, like two thirds of the world uh, voted uh, in support of of a two-state solution, a Jewish state, an Arab state. Do you think that um, uh, the um, if, if there was another vote today, do you think uh, there will be... Uh, how would the vote go in the, in the UN General Assembly? Well, one of the very tragic uh, aspects of... Uh the last half century is to see the decline of the United Nations mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, you know I don't know how the vote would go uh, the uh, the United Nations was damaged you know terribly uh, by the Zionism as racism resolution uh, I really the United Nations has a number of committees and organizations that are a laughing stock they, because they claim they're various dictators that sit on committees about human rights and then denounce Israel all the time. Uh, so I think that I hope in Scandinavia, uh, you know, one of the things that struck me as I was working on the book was the great hopes that people in the United States and all around the world had in the United Nations. Uh, and that the United Nations took its name from the alliance against Nazi Germany, the United Nations fighting against Nazi Germany, Japan, and, and fascist Italy. Yep. And so it was, in that sense, seen as an anti-fascist organization. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that this organization then would have become, you know, a, a, a platform for these constant attacks on Israel is, is, is very unsettling. And I, mm -hmm. um, I hope that the Russian attack, the war of extermination against Ukraine, uh, it, it clearly it has led to a great deal of rethinking in mm -hmm. Sweden. Uh, Norway didn't need as much rethinking. Uh, mm -hmm. Been a you know <clears throat> a crucial member of NATO from the beginning, but uh, uh, I think that uh, especially Swedish. I don't want to pile up, uh, you know, criticize the Swedes, but. But the, the, oh, over oh, the you are free to do that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, no. All right. As you know, the Swedes think that some of them have presented themselves as the world's moral um, uh, superego, and uh, uh, and have uh, been vehement in their criticism of Israel. But I would I would urge people in uh, in Scandinavia to remember the mentalities of anti-fascism and to remember. Mm -hmm. The origins of the Palestinian leadership, yeah. uh, the, the the Palestinian leadership of 1947 was not left wing; they were reactionaries. For sure, yeah. You know, and then and and there was nothing progressive uh, mm -hmm. about uh, the Arab Higher Committee or uh, Jamal Husseini or or Hajim Al Husseini. They yeah. actually had collaborated with Nazi Germany. This is not this is not some you know uh, propaganda. Uh, uh claim it, it's mm -hmm. the truth yeah and uh so it's a terrible tragedy for the palestinians mm -hmm. uh that they had such leadership because uh, if they had accepted the partition plan uh there would have been a palestinian state long ago and these wars and all this terrorism wouldn't have taken place and and uh, the the uh, highly uh, highly educated more educated palestinian middle class could have built a very uh, capable state coexisting with the Jewish state. Yeah. Um, so how how was the development from the 
Arab Higher Committee to PLO to and Fata Arafat Abbas. Is there a because you were saying that uh, um, the Arab Higher Committee they were surely not the leftist and but I guess you you can say the same about Rab Abbas today. He, <laughs> Is a brutal dictator. Yes, I think I, I think that the Palestinian leadership uh, has never really reckoned uh, with uh, the terrible legacy left to them uh, by Husseini and Arafat, and uh, they keep repeating falsehoods about the causes of the 1948 war. Uh, and after doing that for 70 years, it's very difficult to turn around and say. Oops, we made a mistake. Uh, uh, let's change our policies. Uh, and even Mr. Abbas went to Berlin and recently, and in Berlin, he said the kind of thing that the Palestinian Authority says more frequently at home. And it backfired on him badly uh, because now the Germans were really embarrassed to see what he really, really thinks, um, uh, given that the European Union and uh, and the German government is sending a lot of money to the Palestinian Authority, so um, the uh, there yes uh, uh, there there is there is a continuity there is a uh, and and it's important in Scandinavia uh, that people who speak of human rights uh, and democracy and anti colonialism focus far more sharply on what the leaders of Hamas actually believe. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, it's important that people read the Hamas Charter of 1988. Yep. It's a classic fascist document yep. uh, and uh, a shocking document. It, mm -hmm. uh, if some right-wing organization published a document like that, people would be denouncing it you know but for some reason people are not don't read that carefully enough. yeah uh, and uh uh it uh i haven't followed uh contemporary intellectual and political life in scandinavia carefully uh so you know i don't want to speak out of turn and i i'm mm. not sure wh wh what 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 the mood is there but in my in my view if one is a liberal uh or a moderate conservative, or 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 some kind of a leftist, mm. then rejecting fascism uh, and radical anti-Semitism is essential. Yeah. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, Hamas makes no apologies for its view. Mm. Very very clear what they think. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, my colleague in Germany, Matthias Kunzel, uh, has written a book called uh, Nazis in uh, uh, Nazis und der Nahe Osten, wie der Islamische Antisemitismus entstand. Uh, I think there's going to be an English language version. But the after effects of Nazism in the Middle East uh, is an issue that some of us historians have raised. And I think that th that needs more attention, yeah. uh, especially, Absolutely. especially. Uh, from the human rights organizations that claim, and with some justice, uh, to uh, to defend human rights and democracy and all that. They, mm. we, we need a much, much more critical gaze at the Palestinian organizations than has been the case up to now. And of course, not to mention Iran, but that's it. Oh, this is um, this this is fascinating. But I I will let I will let you go soon. But uh, um, and as an as an historian, you probably don't like to looking uh, into the future too much. But um, my sense is that for the last couple of generations, the um, like public support from for Israel has been eroded in Europe and and especially for sh for sure it has in in Norway. Um, but it's still stable or like record high support for Israel in the U.S. according to to some surveys. Do you think that um, this it will keep stable, or do, do you fear that in the la in the next ten or twenty years there will be a similar eroding in the U.S.? Oh, uh, you know, I I I'm I don't know. Uh... I uh, 
Uh, I am concerned that the ideas of that I, that the understanding of the history of the, of the Middle East is is uh, quite weak. Uh, uh, the um, I'm thinking on top of my head at the moment. Uh, uh, um, I've published a book to do, and and as a historian, I've done what I can. Yeah, and uh, I I really uh, obviously if Trump is re is is somehow reelected in 2024, that would be a disaster for Israel. Uh, disaster for Israel. Okay. Uh, uh, and a disaster for all of America's alliances around the world. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the the war in Ukraine uh, may remind many, many people um, of, uh, of, of the danger of aggression and uh, uh, the value of democracy and uh, but I'm very, yes, I'm, I'm to be a yes, of course, I'm very worried about mm -hmm. uh, the extent to which what I regard as anti-Semitic arguments have found a place uh, in what is what what is now liberal parts of liberal and leftist opinion. Um, so I'm fighting back with mm -hmm. and, and, and in not as a polemicist uh, <clears throat> or as an activist, but I'm doing what I can as a historian, uh, which yeah. is to try to present the fact and evidence uh about very famous events and uh uh yeah i think that that's that that's what i would like to focus on uh, yeah. in terms of your question about about the years to come uh, yeah but, uh, i'm not but, a politician uh, but why do you think um a new trump presidency would be a disaster for the relations to israel because some some of our viewers will be would be curious but what what are your arguments for that the power and prestige of the united states of america Mm. Best on many, many things. Uh, there are too many things. It would be a long lecture about that. Yeah. But one thing that it rests on is the belief that the President of the United States tells the truth. Mm. And Donald Trump is a congenital liar. Uh, and uh, that means that the credibility of the United States, both its moral and its uh, political credibility, would be reduced to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, our country would become more and more the subject of derision, if not laughter and disdain. Uh, and uh, uh, no matter how many missiles or tanks or ships or whatever airplanes we had, uh, that that would become increasingly meaningless uh, as the United States uh, uh, turned away uh, from uh, defending liberal democracy uh, and. Uh, 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 nurturing our alliances, respecting our allies, respecting mm. our allies, uh, uh, and not insulting them. Uh, so, uh, a yeah, new but, but, but to continue to play the devil's advocate, so, but Trump did so many good things uh, for Israel in his four, first four years. What, what do you moving, say to that? Moving the embassy to Jerusalem was 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 okay. It was fine and uh, overdue. Um, the uh, getting out of the Iran deal uh, without a uh, a policy really of restraining Iran uh, uh, has not worked out. Um, the uh, the United States needs to be engaged in the world, and in different ways, President Obama and President Trump wanted to retreat or rather if not retreat they wanted to withdraw and uh uh and vladimir putin saw that he saw that uh uh so uh the president biden has tried to restore a balance uh in, in some ways i have a minority view perhaps i think he's a great president and uh uh mm. a decent man and and a very wise man and uh that though those qualities should not be underestimated. Um, uh, he's the best you're going to get out of the United States in our current state. Uh, so uh, it's a very troubled time in this country, and you all know that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, the uh, 
Yeah, I, th- I mean, also Israel's uh, relations with the Arab states uh, have improved dramatically. Uh, yeah. and, uh, that that is a, a source of uh, that is something to be to be welcome. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so there were people in the Trump administration who focused on the importance of Israel's relationship with the Arab states, and they they made it and they. Uh, uh, had a good case to make, uh, but um, uh, the um, uh, no a uh, another four years of Trump. I think the United States would be finished as a as, as a great world power. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, um, and, and 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 the danger of real authoritarianism in the United States, real mm-hmm. authoritarianism, neglecting the, the results of elections, uh, uh, attacking an independent judiciary. Uh, uh, this is something we take seriously. Yeah, um, we do. Yeah, thanks a lot for for your perspective. Also, on that, uh, my organization is a nonpartisan organization, um, so we have um, all kind of members within the Norwegian um, political spectrum, and also, obviously, we mm-hmm. with our members and viewers will have different opinions about Trump and Biden. Um, yes, yes. Well, so, you know, here you so, you asked my opinions, and I'm yeah, yeah, speaking, sure, speaking, exactly. Speaking as a citizen now, as yeah, a historian, a- absolutely. So that um, so that's um, uh, that's fascinating. I just uh, mention it so that um, everybody understands uh, that um, my organization doesn't have an opinion about uh, U.S. politics or or etc. Uh, but it was really really nice. Uh, to have you. This is my moment to say that you all should uh, buy this book and read it <laughs> and um, and look up uh, Jeffrey Herf's uh, other books and thanks a lot for joining us. It was let, really good. Let, let me say just one thing. Uh, yep. uh, I'm a professor at the University of Maryland in College Park in the History Department. And you can get my email address from the website there. So if you read the book and if, and, or you, you, you want to write to me, uh, you, can, you can get my email address there. And I'll be glad to reply. Yeah. And thanks, okay. thanks very, very much. I enjoyed speaking with you. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.